saying the feast, of course, of the Annunciation of the Blessed Virgin Mary, the actual meditation we just had a couple of hours ago on the retreat, the stay, March the 25th, the day in which the, the Holy Mother of God received by the Holy Ghost our Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God, in her womb. And the great beachhead landing came to the earth by which heaven invaded earth in order to conquer it and wipe away the reality of sin and to save our souls. But at this Mass, we are at a sacred time in the Ignatian Retreat. This is a special Mass of the Retreat, and this Retreat Mass is called the Mass of the Prodigal Son. In the prodigal son, we contemplate the meditation we do here in the sermon, and then at the end of the Mass, we receive Holy Communion. And uh, for those that are, there are some that are not Catholics on the retreat, will not be able to receive Holy Communion physically, but will make a spiritual communion. To be able to receive our Lord in their hearts, and to ask Him to truly enter inside, even though physically not yet be able to receive Holy Communion. Though in a short while, hope to be able to solve the difficulty, we would enter into the church completely and to receive Holy Communion physically. So this Mass is the Mass of the Prodigal Son. And we consider in this point of the retreat, is one of the focal points, one of the center points of the Ignatian retreat, we arrive at the point where we meditate on why God man. It was a question asked by St. Anselm 1,000 years ago. Cur Deus Homo. Why God, man? Why did God become man? St. Augustine tells us, we read from the Gospel of St. Luke chapter 15 today and contemplate it, that this was a day which was one of the most sacred days he ever had on earth before the day of his crucifixion. When our Lord traveled from town to town, it was his custom to preach about the kingdom of heaven. He taught a catechism class, said the kingdom of heaven is coming. The apostles watched his procedures, his methods, and he had the same essential themes of his sermons as he went from town to town. And they were begun familiar with how our Lord began to preach, how He began to teach, how He continued, and they would then imitate that throughout their days of preaching. But on this particular day, it's different. This is a day in which Christ went off His normal preaching. And the reason is made very clear by St. Luke the doctor when he said, this particular day, the publicans and the sinners drew near to hear him. Cura Deus Solo. Why did God become man? Today is a day in which he did become man. This March the 25th, 2020 years ago. Today is a day the angel Gabriel visited that house in Nazareth and saw that most magnificent, most beautiful creature of God most wonderful creation that he ever made at the age of 15. And the angel said, Ave Maria, gratia plena. Hail Mary, full of grace. And the Holy Ghost overshadowed her when she said, Fiat. Let it be done. Now what is it that's going to be done? Innocence is in that house. A perfect, innocent angel is visiting that house from heaven. And the most innocent and beautiful of all babes is conceived in her womb. There is no stain of anything other than magnificent beauty in that house. Why is that beauty there? Why on earth is the God of beauty and innocence dwelling in Nazareth? Why does He come inside of human flesh? Why is He there with His most immaculate, most beautiful mother? The reason is, He's come 
to visit sinners. That's why he came. He made that very clear multiple times when he was 30 years old, or 33. He said, I have not come to save the just. So we know he didn't come for them. I have come to save the sinners. So he came, his innocence, his beauty, his magnificence, came to save the sinner. And on this particular day, maybe a year and a half or so before he was crucified, he was surrounded by sinners. And very likely, one of those sinners who was in that crowd was a most wicked prostitute, a most wicked harlot, whose name was Mary Magdalene. And other sinners were in that crowd. And the Lord Jesus Christ saw the publicans and sinners, and his heart was transformed. St. Augustine tells us, when he stood so close to the sinners, why? Because they approached him. What made them do that? There was some kind of magnet. There was some kind of magnet in that sacred heart, in that most innocent, most perfect, most beautiful soul, and that most perfect body of our Lord Jesus Christ, that somehow was a magnet to attract filthy sinners. Why does the filthy come to the innocent? Why does the ugly come to the beautiful? When they recognize that they are filthy, when they recognize that they are ugly, they are attracted to this innocence because somehow this innocence is going to clean me. This beauty is going to transform, transform my ugliness into beauty. This is going to change me, and I want to be near it. It's a feeling, not an understanding. The public is the sinner is drew near to hear him. This is the first verse of chapter 15. And the, and the Pharisees and the Sadducees were scandalized. He said, Behold, sinners come to him. He attracts the scum of the earth. And when our Lord saw them, St. Ambrose, he saw these publicans, he saw these sinners, and how did he know they were publican sinners? Because of how they were dressed, because of how they behaved. They were not dressed perfectly well, they were not behaving perfectly well. And they were attracted to him. And therefore, he forgot his speech. He forgot his normal speech that he would normally give. Because now he's the closest that he has ever been since he was born 32 years earlier to the purpose of his coming. And his heart is moved. Because remember our Lord Jesus Christ said, Can you be baptized? He said it to the twelve apostles. Can you be baptized with the baptism wherewith I am baptized? This is the baptism of blood by which he will shed his blood upon the cross. The apostles want to follow him, but they don't really want to follow him to death yet. They don't want to follow him to blood yet. They don't want to follow him to suffering yet. And so he says, can you be baptized? Can you be baptized with the baptism of which I am baptized? And how am I straightened? It's also the Gospel of St. Luke where he says these words. How am I straightened until it be accomplished? He's anxious. He cannot wait until it is accomplished. He is running to his cross. He is going to the place where he is going to shed his blood to save the sinners, and he is anxious to get there. How am I straightened until he be accomplished? Now today, he stands in front of the sinners, and he breaks down in his love. He who is the Word, God made man, 
the perfect word of the Father. He is at a loss for words on this day, says St. Augustine. The word cannot find words. Because words are not sufficient to carry what is in his most sacred heart. Later on, St. John, who is the closest to our Lord Jesus Christ, he will be attracted. There will be a magnet of that heart that will take the head of St. John the Baptist and make him place it upon the heart of Christ right before Christ is about to die. He will be inspired to put his head upon that sacred heart and listen to the heart. We oftentimes make great mistakes when we tune in our ears. We listen to words. We listen to text. We memorize things. But on this day, the sinners listened to his heart. And on Holy Thursday night, St. John, the apostle of love, the great beloved apostle, he will be able, he will not be able to hold his head away from the heart of Christ. He will bury his head in the heart of Christ and listen to the heart of Christ and hear every word of the divine love spoken during that most sacred supper. Now there he is, surrounded by the publicans and the sinners. Now the first thing that happens to the heart of our Lord Jesus Christ, there are the Pharisees and Sadducees, he doesn't see them anymore. He doesn't hear them anymore. He doesn't pay attention to them at all. His eye is focused upon these sinners. And then he speaks to them three parables. And the third one is the one we contemplate especially in this Mass. The parable of the prodigal son. He speaks three parables. About heaven's rejoicing at the sinner's return to God. Why did he come to this earth? He did come in order to pay a price. He had to pay a price to the Father. He had to pay the price of justice. We owed an infinite price, so he offered an infinite amount of pain. He paid the price. Why did he pay the price? Man does not go to spend money lightly, especially if the money is his own blood. Why did he go to pay the price? He is God. And God, as St. John would tell us, Deus caritas est. God is charity. We can have charity. We can practice charity a little bit. You can touch it and taste it a little. But God is charity. He just is love. And somehow, for some reason, God decided that he loved the thing he made out of nothing more than he loves himself. He loves man whom he made in his own image and likeness. Even though man decided to dirty this image, to scar this likeness by our horrible sins, not just the sin of our great-grandfather Adam. Each of us has decided to add our own sins. We're not satisfied with his wicked sins. We're not satisfied with the sins of our ancestors. We're not satisfied with the crucifixion of Christ. We have to add sins. This is each of our mark that we leave upon the earth. We get to add sins. Add scars. Why doesn't he get tired of us? There is an infinite divine love that is poured into this most sacred human heart. And it loves. It is surrounded by sinners and he just tries to describe to him the rejoicing in heaven when one sinner returns to God. So what does he say? He said, The kingdom of heaven rejoices like unto a shepherd that had 100 sheep. 99 were safe. One was lost. 
St. John Christendom tells us, he always begins with the shepherd. Something sacred about shepherds. When he came to this earth, he decided shepherds would be the ones who would hear the song of heaven. He decided shepherds would be the ones who would visit him first. The kings would come later. But the shepherds came first. And it was a shepherd who was the first one to die. Abel, the shepherd. He decided that all of the Jews, Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, they were all shepherds. And the sons were all shepherds. So there's something sacred about a shepherd. And St. Augustine says, he started his old religion with shepherds. He made sacrifice with shepherds. Because what's a shepherd? The shepherd is a lover of sheep. When you consider other kinds of professions, you consider a man who is a merchant. You don't consider that this guy sells plastic toys. He's a plastic toy seller. You rather consider him as he's rich. And he's rich because he sells plastic toys. He's rich because he sells uh, boats or whatever it is that he sells. But when you consider, the, but we consider only the rich man. We don't care about what he sells. But the shepherd, we don't care about the shepherd. What's a shepherd? He's some guy in the background who takes care of sheep. It's sheep that matter. The shepherd is somebody who sits on the side and watches them, someone that guards them. Who cares about the shepherd? It's the sheep. And hence, I said, because it says, he is a shepherd. Because a shepherd cares about his sheep. The shepherd loves his sheep. And Christ himself will say, the good shepherd lays down his life for his sheep. It's about the sheep. The shepherd is a lover of sheep. The shepherd is a carer of sheep. And these sheep are the creatures of God, whom God loves because he made them, and we are his sheep. Now there were 99 sheep that were safe, and those were all the angels in heaven. And there was one sheep that was lost, and that is all of the human race. He left behind the 99 to go after the lost sheep and carry him upon his own shoulders and bring him back. For Christ came to be a good shepherd who cares only about the sheep, his creatures. And there's great rejoicing when he brings the shepherd's sheep back. But then Christ goes on to the second parable. He said, nay, rather. St. Bede tells us, nay, rather. The heavens rejoicing is not like a shepherd that lost sheep, but something the most important thing in the human heart, says St. Basil. And that's money. You lose sheep, it's tragic. You lose money. That's the greatest tragedy of all. And hence he goes to the second parable. The first parable is, we are sheep, and he carries us on his shoulders. The second parable is, we are money. That's pretty valuable. For there was a woman that had ten silver pieces, and she lost one. She became agitated and worried. She was much more worried than shepherd, because she lost a silver piece. And she tore up the house, and she lit a candle, and she went looking everywhere until she finally found the silver piece. And when she found it, she called together her friends and neighbors. And there was great rejoicing. She said, Rejoice with me, because I have found that which was lost. And such is the rejoicing of heaven. For we are likened to a silver piece, says St. Augustine, and that we have the face of the king upon us. We are made in his image. And that holy woman is like our holy mother of the church, who lights a candle of faith and tears up the house and searches through all the night for the treasure of the church. And what is the treasure of the church? It is the soul of the sinner. That's the treasure. And when the church has found a sinner, it picks it up. And they call together all the friends and neighbors. And these are the monks and the nuns of the church. And this is the Gregorian singing chant of the church. And these are the prayer of the church. When the prayer of the angels in heaven, they rejoice because the sinner has returned to God. And there is great rejoicing. Because a silver piece has been found. Note this, says St. Augustine. Note the degrees of love. For Christ 
is surrounded by the sinner and he just wants to express his love. He wants to express his joy. When one that hated him turns back to love him. When one that wasted all the gifts comes back to him. And then he says, nay rather, it doesn't explain enough, the love of heaven. It is rather like a father that had two sons. And this is the parable of the prodigal son remained remaining in the Gospel of St. Luke, chapter 15. Like unto a father that had two sons, the older son and the younger son. The younger son came to the father one day and said, Father, I want my inheritance. Note this is St. Augustine and St. Bede. The Father is always ready to give us our inheritance. No matter how young we are. I want my inheritance. And he, and he gave the inheritance away. Now there's only this problem about the inheritance. And that is, one cannot get an inheritance from your father until the father dies. First he dies, then you get the stuff. As the Irish proverb goes, wherever there's a will... There's relatives. First you've got to die. Then you get the stuff. Now the problem is, he went in for a medical checkup. He's immune to the coronavirus. He is immune to cancer. He's got a perfect health. This guy is never going to die. The prodigal son is patiently waiting for his daddy to die, but his daddy won't die. He keeps getting a good medical report. And therefore, says St. Augustine, the son says, since you will not die, I will kill you in my heart. Because that's the condition before you get the inheritance. And he decides to kill God in his heart. And he takes the inheritance, and the Father freely gives it to him. And what is our inheritance? There's so many things. Our mind, our will, our heart, our body, our passions, our clothing, our money, our health, our families, our friends. All the things that God has given to us. Infinite number. It's our stuff, it's our inheritance. What do we do? We take the inheritance. Now the prodigal son originally had a plan, at least an official plan, and his plan was to show to his father how he can do well without his father. Now he can do well and he doesn't need to, to he can make more money than his daddy made, he can expand the business and expand the sheep and expand all the things that they have. He just needs time on his own. But the problem is the next verse of the gospel which says, not many days hence, prodigal son left to a far country. He didn't wait very long. Not many days hence, not many days afterwards, the son left to a far country. And why did he do that? Because officially he was going to take the money, he was going to take the possessions to develop the business. To make his own way in the world. To show that he is also an honorable and honest businessman and he can stand on his own two feet. That's the official reason. The real reason was he just wanted to have fun. He just wanted all the things and all the pleasures and all the gifts that can come with money. And since he was so rich, he had made the calculations. He's got so many millions of dollars that if he spends everything on drug, sex, and rock and roll, and he spends everything on the various forms of pleasure of every type for himself, he'll never run out. There's so much there that he'll not run out. So he goes to a far country and he spent himself in riotous living, says the gospel. He spent himself in riotous living. He had to go to a far country because he didn't want his father to see. He decided to party. He decided to have a good time. But there was something he didn't plan. A famine arose in that land. He had well scheduled his plan. He had everything all laid out. But he had not calculated for a famine. It also says this in the sacred gospel, 
After he had spent all, there arose a famine. He spent all kinds, and there arose a famine. The Saint Germanable Bede and Saint John Grisman tell us what was this famine? It was not a famine of a lack of food. It was a famine of good works. When the sinner goes off and decides to live a wicked life and decides to live in pleasure and so on, he discovers that he gets empty. He discovers that there is an emptiness in his heart, an emptiness in his passions, an emptiness all about him. Sin empties us. It makes us empty in the heart, empty in the head. It creates a famine. And the famine becomes unbearable, creating a state of despair. And this famine happens to individuals, but it also happens to cultures. And we can note, as we often note, that in our times, we are in a time in which the whole of the Western civilization has, like the prodigal son, wandered away from God. And we spent ourselves in riotous living, and the money is running out. And there is emptiness in the modern heart. There is discouragement and despair and starvingness all around the modern heart. This is the hallmark of our age and our times. And so what happens? He begins to starve. And then, what does the Gospel tell us? And he went and hired himself out to one who owns swine. I remember for the Jews, it is forbidden to eat of the swine. And it says in the book of Deuteronomy, Cursed be he that feedeth the swine. It is a great curse to have to feed the swine. He was the highest of the high. He was the son of the great father. He was the wealthiest of the wealthy. Now he's feeding swine. He hires himself to a laborer in that world. And the St. Bede tells us, as well as St. Augustine, these is the hiring out to angels, to devils. He's following the wicked spirits. And modern man today is following the wicked spirits. And it's going badly for him. And they're feeding the swine. And he longed to have the husks which the swine did eat. And this is the final food of the sinner. And we're now in an age of husks. But no one would give him. This refers to St. Augustine, to the Catholic, to the Christian. He had the truth. And he abandoned it. He's starving. And he wants the husks, the swine eat. The swine are the normal sinners who live and rot in hell and in, in, in wickedness and impurity and so on. They are also miserable, but they don't know much better. But the prodigal son came from the house of the father. He came from the truth. He came from the true religion. He came from a happy home. He came from a wonderful place. And now he wants the husks. And what are these husks? St. Saint Augustine tells us the husk is a kind of bean that's soft on the outside but empty on the inside, and it loathes rather than nourishes. It's an empty bean. It's the husk, the outside. The husk of the corn. It has no nutritional value whatsoever. It loathes rather than nourishes. When you eat it, you become more empty. And what are the husks? The husks are the final lies of the world. They are the final teaching of the world, which is to tell the sinner... You're okay in your sin. You don't need to go away from your sin. All matters of immorality is okay. Being in a bad marriage is okay. The vice of, 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 of the perversion is okay. And every kind of wickedness is okay. Every kind of evil is okay. And we have scientific studies to prove that it's good. And it's okay, and it's okay, and it's okay. It's okay to abort your children. It's your own body. It's okay to practice birth control. It's okay to do all manner of evil of every type. It's okay, it's okay, it's okay. The problem with this food, the final lies of the world, is that they load rather than nourish. And we become hungrier and more empty the more we eat this trash. But then what happens? And this is the next move we pray to happen for our whole world. Maybe Our Lady will let it happen very soon. A beautiful word in the Gospel of St. Luke, commented very much by St. Bernard of Clairvaux, the great disciple of Our Lady. And it simply says this, 
the prodigal son starving, laying on the ground dying, and he came to himself. That's what the gospel says. And he came to himself. And he remembered the father's house. St. Bernard used to say this passage all the time. He used to go around to the young men, Come, be yourself. O oh, ye sinners, when you turn against God, you're not just offending God. You're not just offending your neighbor. You're offending yourself. You're destroying yourself. You're not being yourself. You're losing your own intelligence. You're losing your own personality. You're losing your own health. You're losing your own spirit. What's left of you? You're not yourself, you sinner, when you sin. Come, be yourself. And St. Bernard used to say those words all the time when he was dragging men into the monastery. They didn't want to come. He says, I don't want to come. I want to stay at night. I want to stay in the world. I want to get married. I want to do this. He would say, no, come, be yourself. Come to the monastery. Come to God. Come, be yourself. O ye sinners, you are not yourself. Pope Francis sent out a special request of prayer that bugs the virus be defeated. Pray to all your gods that we don't succumb to a virus. What is the virus killing the world today? Empty minds that know not God. Empty hearts that do not love God. We have world suffering from emptiness, blackness, darkness, and despair. And they're trying to fill the emptiness with drugs, and it's not working. They're trying to fill the emptiness with sexual pleasure, and it's not working. They're trying to fill the emptiness with video games, and it's not working. With four jobs, and it's not working. With a big house and a swimming pool, and it's not working. They're trying to fill the void with Hinduism, Hindu paganism from India, and it's not working. The foolish yoga and so on comes from the pagans, and it's not working. This emptiness is emptiness, it is ugliness, it is destroying souls, and what do we do to solve the problem? Come, be yourself. Remember the Father's house. Remember the love of the Father. Remember the Holy Mother Church that some left 500 years ago, and some left 100 years ago, and some left last night, and some are leaving today. Remember the Father's house. Our memory will save us. And so it is that that prodigal son remembered the Father's house. And St. Gregory Nazianzen says, O ye sinners, rise up as the prodigal son arose and walk all the way back to the Father's house. Don't stop along the way. This is one of the grave errors of the conservative movement. If you're starving, you got nothing to eat, cyanide's better than nothing. No, it isn't. Come back to real food. Like an old commercial in the 1980s, a man was dying of thirst in the desert. And he was crawling through the desert, dying of thirst. There was a massive pool of water, and he went through the pool of water, went out, went across another pool of water, and there it was, Budweiser. He finally got to Budweiser, and he was able to drink. We were made for good beer. Budweiser is not good beer, by the way. Horrible. We were made for good beer. We were made for good wine. Don't drink the crap. Save up. <laughs> Keep crawling back. And so crawl back all the way to the Father's house. Go all the way to the Father's house. 
long journey. The Council of Trent talks about it and says, here we find a limping of the parable, because a parable is a story, and we say every parable, every comparison limps. Because a parable tells us the father stood on top of the house, and the father had an anxious heart, and the father waited for his son, and the father looked for his son, and one day he saw a man in rags in the distance, and he says, this is not true, says the Council of Trent. Well, the father doesn't wait. He can't wait. In fact, the father goes all the way out to that pit. The father is the one who shakes the son. Do you remember my house? Come, be yourself, my boy. And the father is the one that walks along with him the entire way back. Well, the Holy Ghost comes to the sinner and makes the sinner return to God. And the council dreaded the discussion about it concerning the word conversus dominum. On that morning of Good Friday, St. Peter had turned his back to Christ because he had already denied him three times. And our Lord was being brought back from one of his trials to another trial, and somehow St. Peter got caught. He was warming himself by the fire. He saw Christ, and he turned his back to Christ and warmed himself by the fire so that he wouldn't be noticed. And so the Gospel of St. Mark tells us, and the Lord walked by St. Peter, and it says, Conversus Dominum. The Lord converted. Not Peter. Hmm? Convert means to turn. We don't turn. Christ walked by and conversus dominum. The Lord turned and the Lord looked and he saw Peter. And Peter remembered, just like the prodigal son. And Peter remembered, before the cock crows twice, this night thou shalt deny me three times. And he went out and he wept bitterly. It was the Lord that converted. The Lord turns and looks at us, and let's remember how far we've gone away from God, and how it can be said of us what is said in the book of Kings. It says, the one king, Roboam, he was very bad and committed many sins, and he had a son named Jeroboam. And Jeroboam committed all the sins of his father, but he added more besides. And then he had a son, who committed all the sins of his father, but he added more besides. And the next generation came and committed all the sins of the father, but added more besides. We're 2,000 years down that. We commit all the sins of our fathers, but we're not satisfied with that. We add more besides. Conversus Dominum. The Lord converts the Lord turns, and the Lord looks, and the Lord helps us to remember that we might go out like the wise Saint Peter, one of the most wonderful men ever created by God. Go out and weep bitterly. Now the prodigal son returns. And, and when he returns, what happens? The father sees him in the distance. Now he does several things that our Holy Mother the Church does and show the delicacy and gentleness of the father. He goes out into the field to meet him. Why is that? Because he doesn't want his son to be embarrassed. This boy went out with great pride, with great wealth, with all the stuff. Now he's coming back and he's in rags. What happened to the stuff? It's like the story of St. Bernard who had a monk that had a problem of gambling. And he came to the monastery. And of course, like all monasteries and churches, they're running out of money, running out of money, running out of money. Then where are we going to get the money? And the monk said, you know what? i got a plan. I'm going to go and invest this money here, and I'm going to do a proper gambling job, and I'm going to bring good money back. He said, I don't think it'll work. No, no, I've got to do it. He said, all right, here, I'll give you all my money. You go and, and, and see if you can save money from the monastery. So St. Bernard gave all his money to the young man, and he went out. And as always happens to gamblers, he lost everything. And he was very embarrassed. But he got pretty hungry, because he couldn't eat anymore. So he came back starving to the monastery. 
St. Bernard saw him in the distance and he ran out and said, Oh, did you get my money? Did you save? Did you make all the money to save the monastery? He says, No, I, I lost everything. And then Bernard said, You know, I have to admit, I'm not much different than you. What do you mean? I'm greedy too. I can't take losing everything. When you left, I lost all my money and I lost a monk. I can't take losing everything, so I guess I'll have to take back my monk. I'm back. That's the greediness of God. He can take the loss of his blood. The father can take the loss of his own son. He can take the loss of so many things. But he can't take the loss of my soul. Therefore he offers up everything in order to get it. And so the father went out into the, into the, garden, into the field. And what did he do? He gathered his trusted servants. Now the trusted servants are the priests of our holy church. He got the trusted servants. And he said to the trusted servants three instructions. Go and get the ring. And get the cloak. And get the shoes. And bring them out in the field. The ring, the cloak, and the shoes. So the trusted servants went, they got the ring, they got the cloak, they got the shoes, not all the servants, and they went out in the field because he would not allow his son to be embarrassed. He didn't care about losing all the money that the son had lost, but he didn't want to lose his son. He didn't want his son to come back in disgrace. Therefore they went out in the field with the ring. And St. Augustine tells us it is the ring of unfeigned faith. The ring of faith seal of all the documents, the cloak of sanctifying grace that covers all our ugliness and our sins, the shoes of the gospel of peace that protect us from the damages and rocks of the world. They put on the shoes of the gospel. They gave the ring of faith. They clothed his nakedness and cut away his rags and put on a magnificent cloak. And this happens in the sacrament of penance. And at this time, we consider the great gift of God of the Holy Sacrament of the Confessional. We go out in the field and we bring our sins to God. The trusted servants meet us in the field because they don't want us to be embarrassed. And they bring a ring. And they bring a cloak. And they bring shoes. We bring sins. That's all we have to bring. One day our Lord complained, St. Margaret Mary Alicott, Margaret, you haven't given me all. What do you mean, Lord? I'll give you my every thought, my every word, everything I have. Margaret, I want your sins. You must give me all. We give the gift of sins to God. He gives us the gift of sanctifying grace. He gives us the gift of a most beautiful faith, the pearl of great price. He gives us the gift of the Holy Gospel and how to walk in this world. And that's reality. That's what happens in the Holy Sacrament of Confession. And then, they go home, and he commanded the servants, kill the fatted calf, and spread the word. That, I, that a child who was dead has come to life again, that he that was lost had been found, and there was great rejoicing that the sinners returned to God. And this, of course, is the holy sacrifice of the Mass. And here we consider to thank God for the grace of the Holy Eucharist to be able to eat the fatted calf. It is a great grace to receive our Lord in the Holy Communion. It is a most beautiful and most great grace we take it for granted because we receive it so easily and so often. We also take it for granted the Holy Sacrament of Penance. Now it's time to remember the great gift of God and to thank Him for it. Return to God. 
and let him pour his divine love upon us. Let the sinner not be afraid to bring his heart and his whole being to God. Go into the church, turn away from our sins, receive that fatted calf. For some are not yet Catholic, not able to receive Holy Communion today, but you can receive our Lord in your heart. You can consider the last Holy Communion of the patroness of the Blessed Sacrament, one of them, St. Juliana Falconeri. Juliana had a great love of our Lord in the Holy Eucharist. She lived in the 1200s. But she received a sickness that made it impossible for her to receive Holy Communion. And she said as she was dying, I cannot bear to be away from Christ. Can you please bring him to me? Even though I can't even take a small piece of the host. And the priest acquiesced and brought our Lord into the, into the room where she was dying. And she said... He's too far away. Bring him near me. And the priest brought the host most close to her. He says, no, he's too far away. Put him on my heart. So they laid a corporal out upon her heart and placed one host upon the corporal. And the host went through the corporal and into her heart. And she died. There's more than one way to receive Holy Communion. You know that in our present crisis, they've locked the doors of the churches, or they threaten to lock them. They're not yet officially locked. How many souls who want to receive our Lord will not be able to physically receive Him for a very long time? They can pray to St. Juliana, and ask how to receive our Lord in our hearts. It's been done before, can be done again. We have the Latin essay expression, ab esse ad posse valid latio, from what is to what can be is a valid relation, a valid conclusion. Thank God for the gift of the Holy Eucharist. Thank God for the gift of the Holy Sacrifice of the Mass. And thank God for our most wonderful God, who is Caritas. We do charity sometimes in a small way. He is divine God. And so in any case, we close as always with the words of St. Alphonse of Liguri at the end of this meditation. St. You know, Alphonsus, when he would celebrate the Holy Sacrifice of the Mass every day, he used to, as he was vesting for the Mass, say, Priest of God, celebrate this Mass as if it were your first Mass. Priest of God, celebrate this Mass as if it were your last Mass. Priest of God, celebrate this Mass as if it were your only Mass. So we adapt the words of St. Alphonsus to the souls of those upon the retreat and all of all souls. Servants of God, receive this Holy Communion as if it were your first Holy Communion. And receive this Holy Communion as if it were your last Holy Communion. And receive this Holy Communion as if it were your only Holy Communion. And we will bless you all then to continue this contemplation of the remainder of the Mass. And afterwards, a short Thanksgiving, when we head down for the dinner, of the little celebration dinner of the prodigal son. Afterwards, I'd like to bless you all. Father and Son, Holy Ghost.